1990, Steve Backley was not only the world's best javelin thrower, he was seen by many as the world's finest athlete. Very good, very good. Everything went, went absolutely perfectly. Three world records, European champion. Where did he go from there? Well, that was it, World Athlete of the Year. It was almost a, a fairy tale season. A few months later, it all went wrong. At the 1991 World Championships in Tokyo, the qualifying rounds were supposed to be a formality for Backley. I messed up. Went to qualifying and just didn't happen. Eighty two meters I think was the qualifying distance and I've been throwing eighty eight meters all year long and I threw seventy eight meters. And the best ex explanation I, I think I've had for that was immediately after to the to the British press, who uh, like there you go, <laughs> you're our best hope for a gold medal. What went wrong? And uh, I just said, I think you know, we'll try and try and just about rhythm. And today, I, I don't think I had the rhythm. I couldn't hear the music. They were playing the wrong record. They were playing no record. There was no music. I don't think I remember. I remember looking down the run up and just thinking. What we're doing back here, you know. Just a fortnight after the disaster in Japan, Backley faced an international field once more, this time in England. Everyone in the world came to Sheffield after Tokyo and, and I threw 91.36. The throw was not only good enough to win, it was a new British and Commonwealth record. So in the space of just two weeks, you went from failing even to qualify to being a record breaker. Hmm. And that was because of your mental state. Mick, what else could it be? In two weeks, you don't, you don't change physi physiologically. So it, it can't be anything else. Extraordinary power. Is it? Yes, the mind, I think. The mind is incredibly powerful and, uh, and the body follows it. At the highest level of sport, there is little to separate competitors in terms of fitness or technique. Yet when it comes to the crunch and the intense scrutiny of millions of spectators, some people just lose it. This for the Ryder Cup. between winning and losing is all in the mind. Never more painfully seen than when Doug Saunders putted for the British Open in 1970. The golfer's dream or the golfer's nightmare. Three foot six, a bit downhill. He sees a non-existent obstacle, stops to pick it up. Turned out to be a blade of grass. And he's still got just this one.
knew it would happen before it did happen. Unforgettable moment in Chandler's life. It's no wonder that under such pressure, even the best sometimes crack. But it's only now that scientists are starting to look at what's happening in the minds of sportsmen and women when the heat is really on. I don't think you can ever actually feel that pressure unless you're there. I mean, you know, take my husband for John, you know, he came out um, to, the, to Barcelona at the last minute. And he stood in that stadium with about 15 minutes before I race and he said, how the hell is she ever going to do this? He just said, there's just no way that anyone can do this. You could feel the tension, all the people watching there, how massive this whole event was. And he just thought, she can't do it. I've had it quite hard to think, God, I've actually done that. In the top flight of sport, what is it that makes the difference? That. Pure and simple. Uh, you've got to be good to be there. You've got to have good technique to be there. You've got to be strong. You've got to be determined. You've got to be motivated. It's this. Right, what we're going to do today then, very simple stepping task, two shuffle bars, jump onto the shuffle bars, walking along nice and easy, step over one, step over the other, all the way to the end, and round a couple of times just to get the hang of it. Everybody happy? Where you go. Dave Collins is one of Britain's top sports psychologists, and perhaps it's most open-minded. He's pulling together research from a huge range of scientific disciplines to analyse how stress affects performance. Collins began his career as a Royal Marine, and for this simple experiment, he's gone back to his roots. For these men and women at the Army Physical Training Center, the task of walking along parallel bars set on the ground is as easy as putting the ball into an empty net. Go on, girl, you'll be fine. Go on. But now Collins gets the soldiers to do exactly the same thing again. Only this time, 60 feet up in the air. Remember, don't think, just do it. Can't stop my legs shaking. Don't worry, just go. Come on, just go. Don't try, no. don't try, and, don't try and feel balanced. Yeah. Just go, you know? It's a graphic demonstration of how, when under stress, even the simple can become terrifying. Logically, the soldier is no more likely to fall off the bars now than when she was at ground level. Go for it. But her mind has let fear set in and her body tenses up. She's lost it. I remember moving to Arsenal and my confidence just drained away from me. As the ball came over, I was almost dreading that everyone else would miss it and it would come to me. It seemed to happen so quick. As I looked at the goal, the goalkeeper was this giant of a person that seemed to fill the whole goal and the goal accordingly shrank uh, and there just seemed no way that I was able to score and uh, more often than not that was the case. And how did that feel at the time? It, it is a very public kind of humiliation because there's no hiding place. You can't just walk off. Um, all the players do do at times. They make excuses to come off because their confidence is gone. But uh, I was one of those stupid ones that always tried to stay on the pitch and hope that it would go right, and more often than not, it didn't. A few years later, Chapman, then with Leeds, became the league's most prolific goal scorer. His skills hadn't changed, but confidence makes everything feel different. You seem to have so much time to make the right decision. That's good running on a fine ball. It's almost in slow motion. Time almost stands still. You can actually almost see the indentation in the boot as, as, the, as the winger crosses the ball and it takes an eternity to come over to you and the goal seems enormous but the goalkeeper shrinks accordingly and uh, there just seems an enormous area to hit and you just don't think about failure failure never crosses your mind Chapman! Oh, a magnificent goal by Lee Chapman! Think of a top level which is total control 
everything's fantastic, I'm not having to think about things, things are effortless, I'm really performing on my best. And a bottom level, which is unfortunately much more familiar to most of us, which is out of control. Now, my job as a sports psychologist is to teach the athlete skills so that she or he can get from there into the in-control state. Sports scientists have long acknowledged the importance of total mental control, yet few before have tried to measure it. The reason is simple. It's an intensely personal, almost mystical experience. In 1993, as she prepared for the World Championships in Stuttgart, Sally Gunnell was suffering from a cold. To me, it's all the sort of the way you portray yourself beforehand. You know, it's very important that you're giving off very positive vibe so I would you know make sure that no one could hear me cough and make sure I was still wandering around feeling you know yeah you know, this is it you know you've got to run against me and I'm feeling good here it was all like acting almost you know I was, I was trying to just create this character and try and push down the the little negative me inside that was you know was, was really you know not quite right sort of thing and then by the time I'd got to the line and we're you know we're talking five, ten seconds beforehand, constantly, you know, saying, this is it, go for it, you know, you might never get this chance again. Gunnell was drawn in lane four. Her great rival, the American Sandra Farmer Patrick, was just outside her in lane six. It's weird, really, but um, you totally forget everything. I, I can't really recall why. I mean, it's probably only ever happened to me probably twice in my whole career. I don't ever remember coming off the last hurdle and, and knowing that she was there. I mean, this is what happened. She was actually right ahead of me and she was heading me all the way in, but I don't remember this and it was only me sort of like fighting and going over the line and you know I stood over the line and it was like my life was almost starting again it's almost been on hold for that last you know 52 seven seconds and it was like well what's happened you know I didn't know that I'd actually won and that I'd actually broken the world record everyone thought well she's very calm you know she's just walking around but I was looking to see, you know, what actually happened in that race. I had no idea. It was though I would just run my own, you know, tunnel vision all the way around. I don't remember any of it. It seemed like ages until actually, you know, the commentator had, had actually announced, or the announcer had said, you know, Sally Gunn, our new world record holder, world champion. At that point you woke up? Yeah, it was a little bit like that. It was a little bit um, like waking up. Um, I think the thing is that in my mental preparation beforehand, um, you know, I go over the race so many times of me winning. And I think because I go over it so many times, it is almost like a tape recording. And once I get out there and run the race, I feel very much, I suppose you're, you're getting into your subconsciousness in your mind that, you know, I've been there before. I mean, it's almost like a religious experience. Yeah, you feel as though someone's almost helping you, I must admit, just because it, it does feel so alien at times. You know, as I said before, it doesn't actually particularly feel like me out there, and you almost get into it, it's like a trance. And uh, you feel as though someone's, you know, I always said, someone's watching you and just sort of like, you know, pulling you around the track and, and, and letting you flow around that track. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah it is an amazing feeling. What Sally Gunnell had just experienced was a state of mind now recognized by most sports scientists as the key to top performance under stress. It's often referred to as the zone. The zone, it's a term used where you can't do anything wrong, whether you're hitting a backhand, a forehand, or serve, or anything, and it all seems to land in. I mean. Even the most uh, ridiculous shot you possibly could try on the court, it seems to work for some reason. And when that's happening, you, you don't ask too many questions and you just stay with it. You don't know where it comes from. It just comes. It's like, wow, yes, this is what I want to do. This is the shot I'm going to hit. On the 16th, uh, I was one up against uh, Lauren Roberts in the singles. I mean, 
crucial time of the match. You know, it was coming right down to the wire. And he'd hit a good second shot, just stopped short enough. And I actually walked, I walked off the fair, went over to Suzanne and said, watch this. I'm ready, watch this. Sam Torrance is one up on Lauren Roberts. And you knew. I you knew I was going to do it. I'm, this is it. I'm just going to do it. Forget everything else, what it means, what it's going to win. Uh, just do it. There it is. And a great approach shot from Sam. Unbelievable golf. Under the utmost pressure, you can almost feel the tension. Unbeaten with 94 in the first innings. Still unbeaten with 100 in the second. And he gets there with a very pure stroke as well. Perhaps you don't remember each individual delivery, but you remember the feeling of control that you had at that point, or the, the feeling of um, almost like in a, some people call it in a bubble, in a zone, in a trance if you like, um, where the ball's coming, you're in control, you know you're not going to get out, you know you're going to be there and get lots of runs, and that's obviously a great uh, zone to be in. Um, you're not always in that, sadly. It's bordering on an altered state of awareness. I've taken two steps back out from myself. And I'm doing something. And I'm very aware because everything is crystal clear. And it's happening in normal time, but in a very controlled way and I'm observing it. It's a feeling that everything is happening right and instinctively and uh, automatically. Um, there, there is a certain sense of peace, calm, tranquility, uh, incredibly correct decision making. You are one with what you're doing. Really, at one level, the zone is an absence of negatives. And then if you want to go to the the top level then the zone is everything is so positive you just flip into a super positive mode and that's when you start I'm sure what your athletes will talk about is these experiences of things just flowing and being effortless and so enjoyable once or twice in a career finding yourself in the zone can bring the greatest rewards in sport but what scientists now want to know is what this mysterious mental state really is and what you have to do to get there. Six Coupe, the drive of your life. Duracell is no ordinary battery. Because Duracell lasts longer, why settle for anything less? Better make it Duracell. Hey, is your film as easy to load as this? Mm, hardly. Can your camera take different picture sizes whenever you want? Oh, shame. How about an index print that makes it this easy to order reprints? No, nope, thought not. You don't just need a new camera. What you need is an advanced photo system like Kodak Advantix. It's a different kind of film and a different kind of camera. Together they can help you take better pictures. <laughs> What's an e-business? What's an e-business? E-business. E-business. I don't know. What's an e-business? I don't know. That order's come through. Julie, we've just got a Christmas card from that electrician that was here last month. Got the electrician? Oh, oh well, got an excuse to call him now. <laughs> In business, everyone responds to a card. There's much to be said for failure. 
it's so much more interesting than success. Do you know what I mean? If at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. Then quit. Shh. There's no point making a fool of yourself. Because Campbell's soup is condensed, you just add a can of water to make double, double the amount of delicious soup every single time. Hello? Hi, it's Jeffrey. Yeah? I've just finished my latest novel. I think it would make a terrific film. Okay, Jeff, read it to me. The sun rose... Good news for anyone phoning abroad. BT's extra call sale. For three months, calls made over your average bill will get a 25% credit. And the Prime Minister lived happily ever after. Uh, listen, you got anything with dinosaurs in it? BT's extra call sale. It's good to talk. The martial arts have always regarded the attainment of total mental control as not just useful, but essential to good performance. It may seem paradoxical that amidst the intense activity of a sport like kendo, it's possible to remain calm and controlled. Yet many kendo fighters use the practice of Zen meditation to help them do just that. And Western scientists have now found physiological evidence to suggest that it works. In this experiment, kendo master Masataki Sumi is to practice with an able but less experienced fighter, Paul Budden. Both men are of similar age and fitness, and both are wearing electronic heart rate monitors which are sending a signal to a digital watch attached to their tunics. The watch records the pattern of their heartbeats as they fight. After four practice sessions of a few minutes each, the heart rates of the two fighters will be downloaded into a computer for analysis. Despite the men's similar physical fitness, the heart rate of the kendo master is consistently lower. He seems to have remained more calm. We've got here the two resting data to begin with. Um, Professor Sumi is red and Paul is in black. And we have the first practice here, where their heart rates remain fairly similar. You get a fairly similar response. But then, as the practice develops, you can see that Paul, the black line, and Sumi's the red line, begin to separate out. Now, you, you could produce several interpretations for this, but this has actually been um, you know, observed before, and it is very characteristic of high-grade kendokas heart rates in response to them when they're practicing with those of lower grade, and I think shows fairly clearly the uh, effect that kendo training over a long period of time can actually have upon one state of Relaxation and calmness. Mushin the ability to control the mind uh, is absolutely crucial. And I can refer to one match which is considered to be a classic in tennis terms when Arthur Ashe played Jimmy Connors and in many ways they were considered to be a real mismatch in terms of uh, abilities. Game Change ends, he sat down and was perceived to be meditating, to bring his mind back to the here and now, keep his feet well and truly on the ground and keep him firmly positive in the direction that he needed to go to win the match. And he was, as we know, successful. Do you think he's getting himself into the zone? No question about it. And I think uh, if he were here today, he would be saying exactly the same thing. And in many ways, he was one of the first players who really started to, to tackle this issue. And of course, many more players now recognize how important this is.
If you want to get into the zone, you first have to find inner calm. One way is through meditation, but there are other equally effective methods. I think of each part of my body and just go through it slowly like my feet and just think of my feet and just let it go whatever and then shins, knees, right up, calves, thighs, back, uh, tummy, chest, shoulders, arms, hands, neck, face. And by that time, I'm literally, I'm sitting on the loo, and I mean, my, my feet, my hands are down by my ankles. If anyone could pull me up now, I'd get... Uh, so you do this on the loo before... I do, I do, I always go ten minutes before, just, just about ten minutes, just to give me, I only do it for a minute, you know, and just let my body go down, and then go and try and play. And that's all it takes, just one minute to get yourself into yeah, that? Yeah, at seconds. I mean, just the actual, by the time you've got to the last part of your anatomy, I'm down there. I mean, I'm... And I can't be holding in. You know, if I've got a fag in my hand, I've actually dropped the fag. Some scientists, including Dave Collins, are now beginning to see close links between the mental state acquired through relaxation techniques and the peak physical performance is attained when in the zone. What I'm doing when I meditate is I'm focusing on a, if you like, a riddle, a koan, and I try to, to gain by looking at this koan an insight. Um, much simpler uh, meditation and much more common meditation involves, for example, me focusing on the sound of my breathing. So just as I, as I sat here and meditated, I was focusing on how long it took me to breathe out, how long it took me to breathe in, and the sound and the feel that the air made as it went through. The intense focus Collins describes in meditation is remarkably similar to that reported by sports people when in the zone. This is no coincidence. It now seems there's a direct physiological link between the two states. During meditation, brain activity can be monitored by an electroencephalogram, or EEG. Once in a meditative state, the brain begins to transmit distinctive patterns of signals known as alpha waves. Alpha waves refer to um, what we'd all commonly call brain waves. And what happens is each of your brain cells generates a little electric signal. Now, of course, you can't record each of the hundred billion brain cells that you have by simply having an electrode on your scalp. But nonetheless, if you do put electrodes on the scalp of people, you can pick up waves of this activity that sort of echoes, if you like, coming through the bone. So what you can record is not so much a single brain cell doing its job, but you can record within a population, a gross form of activity of how these brain cells are behaving. Now, when you're very, very alert, they all do their own thing, and that's called desynchronized. They are therefore not working together. But in certain types of states, certain levels of arousal, they go into very characteristic rhythms. An algorithm is one of those associated with the relaxed state. I mean, I got into working in EEG because as a martial artist, I was interested in trying to, to marry up or, to, or to, to come to terms with the writing of, of the ancient masters. When you strike, take as your thought the thought of no thought, the idea of emptying and clearing your mind. And I was interested to see if I could measure that. The experiment Collins devised involved wiring up Leon Griffin from the British Olympic weightlifting team with the same EEG equipment used to detect alpha waves when Collins was meditating. Leon has been coached to prepare for his lifts by closing his mind to all the stresses and distractions around him. If Leon has successfully achieved a focused but relaxed state, then Collins would expect to see him produce alpha wave activity of exactly the same kind as someone sitting still and meditating. The data proved more conclusive than any of the researchers expected. That's when you're, you were stood across there trying to shut everything out in a still position. 
and, and as you can see it's a very distinctive pattern alpha activity that is alpha activity that's classic is that 010 that's, oh, so that's over the visual is that cortex. a lot of internal that's yeah. basically that's the activity over the back of the head the visual cortex which means that you're not taking information in so basically you are you're not attending to what's going around you and internalizing and getting ready for the lift. So imagine you would be daydreaming, like, and you'd be, st you know, so your eyes are open, mm. but not coming. You're gone, <laughs> yeah, and you're not letting anything in, and that that's cool. As you're just about to lift now, nice. and then come to that seal up there, just before the lift, and, and this bigger. is the lift here. <coughs> come on, finish it. So you've stood up, and now you're into the second, the second phase. Yeah. And look, central sight. Is that a lot? Is that a lot of alpha? Yeah, that is a lot. That is a, a bloody lot of alpha. All right. It's confirming what the lifters say. Uh, the lifters are very, very good at if you are like, going into a mental room and getting themselves out of the situation. So here's Leon at the back here, and he's trying to ignore all this stuff that's going on. He doesn't usually lift like this, and he's very, very good at shutting himself off and that 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 quality of his capacity to be able to stay inside himself is shown by the you know we think the power of alpha that we're getting oh it's literally I'll go I'll go down to the bar and everything just switches off there's nothing there I'm paying no attention to any of you lot it's just, I'm just I'm gonna lift I'm gonna lift this weight here now and that's what we see so you're not really thinking about it not at all no. and that's what we see in that alpha if he was thinking about something it's likely well, it's, it's possible it's going to be negative, that's going to get in the way, or it's possible that he's going to think too much about one little bit of the lift, and that's going to disrupt the fine timing. And we know that imagining yourself doing badly is really effective. It's actually more effective at making you do badly than imaging yourself doing well is at making you do well. This need to banish distracting or negative thoughts and to keep the mind firmly in the present is one of the first steps towards mental control. The more you think about things in tennis, the worse it goes. You just, you just try to stay in the present and just keep focused one point at a time and not worry whether, okay, this point's going to get me to number 10 in the world. Or this point here is going to make me this much money. At this point here is going to do this for me and that. Once all those thoughts enter your mind, you're thinking the wrong thing and you're not staying in the present. Have there been times when you've made that mistake? Yeah, I made that mistake. I, I made it at the open, actually. Five, two, Rizetsky. That was uh, playing Krychek. I was up 5-2 in the third set tiebreaker. I say, oh my god, two points away from getting to the semi of the US Open. All of a sudden I, I got I got nervous. I um, I hesitated on coming in to hit a volley. And then after that I, I netted a volley I should have made. Suddenly the whole scene changes. All of a sudden instead of Winning the match three sets to love, I'm down set points, but then I, I regrouped my mind, said, okay, that's fine, no big deal, I'm just going to concentrate the rest of the, rest of the tiebreaker. And I managed to take the next three points in a row to win it. Yeah, that chair, he knew as soon as he caught that one. They can hear, heard that chair from Rzezki in Manhattan. All the principles of inner calm, focus, control, and positive thinking are brought together with particular intensity in competitive pistol shooting. The shooter tries to become so still and relaxed that he exhibits no discernible movement, even at the point of firing. But the real test of the effectiveness of entering a meditative state would be if Collins and his researchers found a direct, measurable connection between the occurrence of alpha and improved performance. That's interference of the wires, his head movement. There's, uh, there's the very little you can do about that. But when you stay still, everything starts to settle down. 
there's two periods of settling. There's one prior to picking the gun up, where he's readying himself, and then he goes, starts the second phase of settling, and you can see that the the brain activity seems to follow that. And there's the shot itself, after a full period of quiet. There's the shot again, there's some alpha. We'd need to analyze it fully to find out exactly where it was and how much alpha power was in there. What the data showed was a striking link between alpha waves and successful shots. This is um, some EEG data taken from the front layer of the brain and um, shows the alpha activity from six seconds before shot towards the shot itself. And we've taken five good shots and five bad shots and compared the alpha power in those shots. As you can see, the good shots have a higher alpha power throughout that phase compared with the bad shots, a progressively lower alpha power towards the shot itself. When the alpha power gets higher, that's actually when the brain, in a sense, is quietening down, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so there's less processing going on within this area of the brain. Um, research suggests that this could be linked with potential effort. So that having more effort in the bad shot towards the shot itself, as indicated by a lower alpha power. So that actually when they've got bad shots, it's because perhaps they're, they're thinking too much about it, they're trying too hard. Yeah, there's more effort being uh, maybe keeping the gun steady before the shot itself. And on the good shots, it's when they just... Letting they're it in go. a flow state, yeah, they're performing well. Um, a, the correct attentional focus, less effort maybe as well. By identifying alpha waves, scientists can see when the athlete is becoming calm and focused. But what is the brain actually doing when it goes into the zone state? One view is that the zone is a physiological phenomenon in which millions of brain cells group together undisturbed, creating a very specific form of consciousness. I think that one could say that within the brain there's no fixed center, but different numbers of brain cells can be pressed into service, and I call those assemblies, but it doesn't really matter what word one uses. You can imagine it's a bit like a stone going in a puddle, generating ripples. There's some epicenter, some trigger, and that will then recruit to varying degrees different amounts of brain cells. And the amount of brain cells recruited that are rippling at any one moment, for my mind, could correspond to the depth of your consciousness. We can then go back to the zone. It strikes me that the zone is a very powerful stone thrown with the ripples undisturbed, without any rivals, without any other stones being thrown in. Now, I can't point to a magic area of the brain where this occurs. In fact, my own view is that there's no one committed brain area, that different bits of the brain will all contribute and help. But nonetheless, I think we can link it to a physiological phenomenon. So I think it's something that perhaps all of us have experienced, for example, when you're buried in a novel, and you're absolutely oblivious to all else that's happening, or you're concentrating on, on some task at hand, so you don't even hear someone talking to you. These might be small, perhaps more dilute examples of what the sports people experience and have in a very powerful, powerful way. If you want to be a winner, it seems there's something you first have to lose, your conscious self. What science seems to say is, you'll do more if you think less. This may be easy enough when there's time to stop and meditate, but what about when the body is highly active? How can a sports person perform acts requiring complex physical coordination without thinking? In the early 1970s, an American, Timothy Galway, wrote a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. In it he argued that any of us, even a novice, could hit the ball better if we stopped our conscious thoughts from hindering our unconscious instincts. One of the drills that he came up with, which I found fascinating, uh, and used actually a lot in my tennis playing career, was what was known as the bounce hit. Very simple thing. When the ball comes to you and the ball bounces, you say bounce. You might say it internally if you're playing a match. And when you hit it, you say hit. 
Now, immediately, what you're having to do there is focus on the ball. How often have we been told, I was told by mother, mother and father, watch the ball. But of course, you know, that instruction, watch the ball, is not a particularly easy one to, to put into practice. But if you have to synchronize your thinking with the happening of the ball, the bounce and the hit, immediately you're at one with the ball. And immediately your focus is in the right direction. You can't, afford, you can't uh, think of anything else. It's almost as though you're in a, in a zone rather like a mantra, if you like, in, uh, in meditation terms. It gets the mind right on, in touch with what you're trying to do. When you get on the court, you want to just be focused on the one thing, which is the tennis ball. I mean, it's great to have the crowd there supporting you and cheering you on throughout. But when you're playing, you want to be in a state where all you see is that tennis ball and trying to win that point. It's not always the brightest people who get to the top of sports necessarily. It's the ones who probably have that focus and one focus where they can focus in on one thing all the time and staying, well, whether it's staying in the present or just focusing on only playing tennis. So you have to be very, how would you describe it, not one-dimensional, but very oriented to one thing. If I ever went to try and run 400 meters without the hurdles, I would tense up and I wouldn't particularly run particularly well in those races. But with the hurdles, I looked at it as a way of relaxing. You know, I'd flow over the hurdles I never looked at it as a barrier. I never looked at it as something that was in the way. Once a skill requiring complex timing and coordination has been well practiced, it can be made to appear impossibly simple. And as it's repeated time and time again, the smoothness and ease of the movements seems only to increase. It then becomes possible to concentrate on the feeling of the movement rather than the technique it requires. But this strange and wonderful sensation is not as mystical as it may sound. We're now beginning to understand how our brains are pre-programmed both to help us learn complex skills and to perform them again and again without thinking. The complex movement isn't just a single movement. It's a series of movements that varies. And they vary according to information coming in for your senses. Firstly, there's the signals, so-called proprioceptive signals, from different parts of your body, telling you where your limbs are in space, what your posture is, how much force or tension you're exerting on something you might be holding or needing to support or, or hold up. Then, of course, with your two eyes, and usually you need two eyes to very accurately judge something, how far something is away from you. Your ears also might be telling you the location of something as it clutters to the floor, for example. And you're having to summate and sort out all this information from the senses and at the same time sort out a corresponding movement, an appropriate movement, that will adjust to that immediate feedback. Now, as if that's not bad enough, this has to be done very quickly. It's not as if you have time to think. We now know the area of the brain where most of this activity um, is achieved, and that's an area called the cerebellum. If I was to turn around and take away my skull, you'd see a kind of cauliflower object, almost like a clenched fist, nestling on the back of my brain. It does, in many ways, function as the brain's autopilot. In order for the cerebellum to work, it seems we do not need necessarily active, conscious concentration or thought. Indeed, the function of the cerebellum will be to free you up to think about other things or to concentrate on other things. When you're playing absolutely well, um, you basically think of nothing. Uh, you're watching the ball in the bowler's hand. Uh, and you don't stop watching it until you hit it. The tennis ball comes at you so fast, how do you manage to react to it? Well, you have about 0.3 of a second to react to it, and uh, it's just being calm in the mind and all the practice that you've done before. I mean, your muscles are used to it. I mean, once you get the stress in your body and you get a little bit of nervousness, it doesn't flow, so you have to make sure you're relaxed and, uh, and just really focused. There is increasing evidence that once we've learned how to do something, our unconscious gains a life of its own and can sometimes perform a task much better than our conscious. Okay, when you open your eyes, I want you to pick up the left hand object. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. In this experiment, a subject is asked to pick up one of the two small rods placed within an optical illusion. As she does so, the movement of her hand is recorded with minute precision 
by tracking the infrared emitting diodes taped to her fingers. Once she has done this, she is asked to say how the two rods appeared to her. Now, did they look the same or different? Different. Which one looks bigger? The object on the left. Okay, close your eyes. In fact, they were the same size. Her conscious brain is always fooled by the illusion. Yet amazingly, her hand is not. When you open your eyes, I want you to pick up the left hand object. By looking at the grip a hand forms two-thirds of the way through reaching for an object, researchers can tell the size of the object the fingers think they're going to pick up. And what they find in this experiment is that the fingers are never fooled by the illusion into preparing the wrong grip. Although signals from the eye arrive at one place in the brain, at that point they separate and they go off in two different processing streams. And in one stream, the end result of the processing is the kind of conscious perception and recognition of objects that we're familiar with. That's the thing that makes you able to say, that's an apple. That I'm exactly, about to yes, and to plan your actions accordingly. Whereas the other system is one that seems to guide your actions online. So it's the here and now aspect of the object which is guiding your behavior when, for example, grasping the object. So if you're picking up an apple, then it's the other system that's doing it. It actually just does the task, never mind what you're thinking about. That's right. It makes no difference to that system whether it's an apple or an orange or whatever it is. If it's that particular size, then it will operate in the same way. All it's interested in is the dimensions of the object, the way it's oriented and placed in space. In Milner's view, the separate system that makes our hands immune to the trickery of an optical illusion is the same one that lets us catch a cricket ball without thinking. It's a very fast system. It's clearly evolved to be a fast system so that, for example, our uh, primate ancestors could swing from branch to branch in a tree and very accurately grasp a branch uh, and not miss it and, of course, uh, do it just at the right instant uh, when they need to, to grab hold of it. So the system is designed by evolution to be a very fast system. The message emerging from the scientists seems clear. If you want to be top in sport, don't think about it. Indeed, the slogan of one sports manufacturer may be sound scientific advice. But though some parts of our brains have evolved to perform great skills unconsciously, other parts have evolved to think and analyze. That's what makes humans so clever. The irony is that in sport, that cleverness can be the last thing we need. The brain likes to throw up activity that's going to get in the way of you performing. And if you're a slip catcher and the ball comes, bang, you catch it then that's very different to under a skying ball and looking at it and thinking about it. I hope the selector isn't watching this. What will happen if I miss this catch? If I've got time and my brain is, loves throwing worry in, then the more time, the more potential disruption. If you're a sports person and you're performing some very intricate skill, basically that's best done on autopilot with the cerebellum, the cauliflower area at the back, absolutely coordinating the inputs of the senses and the outgoings of the movements. Now normally the way that works, for example when you're driving, is that frees up your mind, literally your mind, for fanciful thoughts, fantasies, memories, plotting revenge or doing whatever one wishes to do. And that is absolutely at odds with being concentrating on just one thing. And it might be perhaps that's why it's so hard and so remarkable that people and perhaps that's why they only achieve it at certain times in their lives, where on the one hand you're letting your brain, brain run on autopilot, your cerebellum do all the sensory motor coordination. You're not conscious of that, you're freed up from that, but at the same time you're not freed into a whole complex infrastructure of thoughts, fantasies, hopes and dreams. You're in a way reducing your consciousness um, to nothing, but at the same time not being conscious of the movement. And that, might, that must be quite hard to do, it's almost paradoxical, and I can see why perhaps that is so hard for people um, to achieve. Athletes who got into the zone have managed to compartmentalize and control their minds to what scientists regard as an extraordinary degree. It's no wonder it's something that few ever really experience. But imagine if you achieved that ultimate state, it had its rewards snatched from you. Despite a career plagued by injury, Derek Redmond began the semi-final of the 400 meters in Barcelona in 1992 as a strong favorite not only for a final place, but for a medal. I was in the zone. <laughs> I was, everything had gone right. At the start I said, on your marks. And I knew I'd won it. 
mentally I'd, I'd won the race and I was just floating down the back straight I felt like I was running on air I look at the film now just the way I was running was absolutely brilliant and all of a sudden I had a, what I thought was a gunshot from the crowd um, carried on running next thing you know that I thought somebody had shot me and I thought I'd been shot in the back of the leg and that was it you know your hamstring goes there's nothing you can do you go up and you come straight back down again game over and I remember getting up and thinking if you get up now you can still qualify and they've got 50 meters to go and they're all flying I've got 250 meters to go and three hamstrings and I'm still thinking that I can qualify you really believe I'm, you can still get through. if you had come up to me then and said I bet you anything in the world you, you, you can't qualify I would have said you're on I honestly felt I could still qualify Redmond was so deeply in the zone that his mind simply refused to accept what his body was telling him. Next thing I know, someone puts their hands around their shoulders and as we came around the bed and I tried to flick their, flick their arms off. And I heard my dad say, look, it's me, it's me. You, know, you don't have to do this. And I turned and said, I do. He said to me, well, look, we started everything together. We'll finish this race together. And at that point, I couldn't hold it in anymore. And it was like, everything came out. Did you feel cheated in a sense? Oh, pissed off, cheated, gutted. Yeah, I really thought I was owed something by somebody, but I didn't know who. Um, and I really wanted the whole world of athletics to stop until I got myself back in shape and then we can all carry on again. You know, if I had a wish, most people's wish would be to have, you know, all the money in the world. My actual wish would be to go back and finish that race. There's absolutely nothing I can do about it. There was definitely a part of me that, you know, was dead and buried and I'll never really you know, get to see it again. And I'll never get that particular situation of those athletes at that time, all in that shape. It's gone forever, you know, and there's nothing I can do about it. Redmond never ran again. He'd won the battle with his mind, only for his body to let him down. When the best in sport step out to perform, they push their bodies and minds to limits the rest of us regard as superhuman. But if for all their efforts they fail, their anguish and pain reminds us that they are, after all, still mortal. If you have any questions about tonight's Equinox, you can call Science Line on 0345 600 treble 4. Lines are open until midnight tonight and any weekday between 1 and 7 p.m. Calls are charged at the local rate. Next week, can scientists solve the mystery of what hit the remote Siberian tundra in 1908? A cosmic conundrum next Monday at 9 o'clock. If I wasn't with Jason, I'd either be dead or I'd be in jail or whatever. So, you know, I did make the right choice. The only thing that I had heard was like footballers, what they're like. They're known to be naughty boys. Singer, actress, dancer, model, footballer's wife. A marriage of two halves, cutting.